Hi everybody and welcome to this presentation about bone broth and whether it could help to heal your gut. If you don't recognize me, I'm Ashley Oswald. I am a registered dietitian and founded Oswald Digestive Clinic and I get to present this information to you today. So let's just go ahead and dive right in. So what is bone broth? Uh, bone broth is made by simmering the bones and connective tissue of animals for one to two days. It can be used in soups and sauces or on its own as a health drink, and it is popular among chefs, holistic practitioners, and athletes for its potential healing properties. And I'm gonna help to break down the science for you today. I put up this image here of Brodo, which is a newer restaurant in New York City that is mostly, you know, at the time I was looking into it, it was just selling bone broths. They might have expanded now into soups and things, but it's just kind of goes to show how popular bone broth has gotten over the past few years. And I actually have a personal story growing up. My mom would use gelatin to strengthen her nails. And we're going to talk about what's the difference between collagen and gelatin and you know, all that, but it actually is and was effective. So it's uh, pretty cool when you see those instant changes as far as um, food as medicine goes. So bone broth, it's been a cultural staple for some time for its uh, healing, immune boosting properties throughout history. So Thai use it in their noodle soup, the Vietnamese in their pho, the Japanese in their miso soup, which they've always say is kind of boosting for the immune system, helping to fight off colds. The Caribbean use this in uh, their cow foot soup. And we're going to talk about cow, like feet in particular, what kind of added benefit that might have. In Chinese medicine, it's been said to help with building blood cells and bones, strengthening the kidneys, supporting the digestive system, recovering from stress. Uh, the Russian borscht uses bone broth. And then this is an interesting little story. In 18th century Paris, travelers stayed at the night and inns and guest houses and they were served something called restoratives, um, which is basically hot broths. And this is was the first dish on the menu in early restaurants in France and it kind of led to that word restaurant. So really this hot broth, this bone broth is the root of where that term restaurant came from. So just kind of a fun fact there. So we don't have any really big double blinded placebo controlled randomized trials to see whether bone broth helps with chronic disease states. But if you also think about it, how would we do a great study that way on bone broth? It's a challenging study to implement because you'd have to have one group doing a sing, you know, regular amount of bone broth, you know, maybe a few times a day for many months, and then the other group not. But then we'd have to just see how the diseases progress. And the kicker is you have to have all the other variables the same. So only the bone broth has to be different in the two groups to have a good, you know, randomized control trial and you know you can't really hide bone broth you know the group taking the bone broth they're going to know they're taking the bone broth so it's a difficult that's why nutrition research is challenging but we can't a discredit generations of anecdotal evidence from cultures around the globe and then b we have research supporting some of the health benefits of the individual components of bone broth so that's pretty cool and that's what i want to talk to you about today so i want to kind of lay some of this foundation so that you have a better understanding of what this is this is because i think a lot of people are confused on it. So I want to talk about collagen versus gelatin. And so both collagen and gelatin are in bone broth. And what the difference is, is that collagen is, you know, A, the most abundant protein in the body. You can think of it as that glue that holds everything together, like the bones um, found in the bones, the skin, the joints, the ligaments, tendons, connective tissue, and in the gut. And then in gelatin is a degraded cooked down form of collagen. So they're almost one and the same. Basically, gelatin is made from collagen, which is why both of them are found in bone broth. And so about a quarter of the protein in the body is collagen. It starts to decline when people are in their 30s, like age 30s. And then in the 40s, you start to see some wrinkles, sagging skin, weaker bones, stiff joints, maybe bad eyesight, um, can all come about from decreasing collagen. 
So this is a common additive to like anti-wrinkle face creams and things, but it's mostly marketing because the can skin can't absorb the large molecules that get added to skin creams and things. So we really should be getting it from our, our fluids. And so the gelatin, it can kind of congeal in the fridge. If you've ever had Jello as a kid, which is made from gelatin, you can see how it congeals and can make more of a, a solid. And um, it's not a complete protein, but it does have non-essential amino acids that the body might have a higher demand for in times of surgery, infection, and healing. So it can help the body heal fast. And on the next slide, I'm gonna talk about some of these amino acids. Um, on this slide, I also wanna add that it's, you know, collagen and gelatin, they're not a well-rounded protein. It's not gonna meet all your kind of amino acid needs, which again, protein is broken down into amino acids, which then the body uses. And so um, further, you have to have a healthy gut to properly break down proteins into amino acids. So that's part of why bone broth is being promoted for people with gut issues, because it's thought that someone with poor gut health is gonna have a better chance of absorbing some of these amino acids from the broth better. What's not being talked about is that broth isn't a comprehensive amino acid. Like if someone's just trying to get their, their amino acids or these parts of the proteins from just bone broth, they're gonna be missing out on really important essential amino acids. So the collagen research, it's largely around arthritis and skin health. So it's been shown to have positive benefits for osteoarthritis. And then also for skin health, it was shown to improve skin hydration and elasticity in older individuals. Could help reduce skin wrinkles. It could be helpful for hair growth and strong nails. Uh, and then um, it can help to promote kind of the, the strength of hair as well. So the amino acids, these again are the building blocks of proteins. We have the essential ones, which cannot be made by the body, must come from food. And then we have the non-essential ones, which can be made by the body. So bone broth, it contains a lot of non-essential amino acids, but why it could still be helpful is that during times of illness and stress, like with chronic diseases, for example, um, the non-essential amino acids might become conditionally essential, which basically means your body has a higher demand and the body can't keep up with the demand for the non-essential amino acids. So what are the ones that are in bone broth? Here we have them. Glycine, which is the most abundant amino acid in bone broth. It helps to make this thing called glutathione, which is an important antioxidant. It's known as like the mother of antioxidants, which basically helps prevent, protect your cells from damage. And it's really supportive for detoxification, this natural detox in the body. And it also interestingly can help to make bio salts, which you might know is important for helping to break down and digest fats, which um, fats, if you're eating the right types, the anti-inflammatory types like we talked about in the core course, that's gonna be really important and necessary for your body to get that in and into your cells to be properly used. And then also glycine can help to calm mood. So broth can help give like, some anti-anxiety benefits, some calming benefits. Now, if broth makes you anxious, it could be instead that you're reacting and having a buildup of glutamate from the broth or you're sensitive to histamines and then you'd wanna talk with a functional nutrition dietitian or medicine, functional medicine doctor to kind of explore why you're having that reaction a little bit further because if you're histamine intolerant, you'll want to try to find the root cause to why you're being having a sensitive reaction to histamines. But I digress. So cysteine can help to thin the mucus from the lungs so that the mucus can be expelled more easily. So basically it makes that lung mucus less sticky and could help to improve breathing. Glutamine is the preferred fuel source for gut cells. And if you're having gut issues, maybe you have Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, some other issues in your gut, it might be that your body has a higher demand for this glutamine to help heal the gut because it be, is the preferred fuel source. And then arginine helps to support the immune system. Proline helps to repair proteins. Some other nutrients in bone broth include these things called GAG. So if in your broth 
you or whoever made it used cartilage rich bones which would be like chicken feet um, any feet so I'm coming back to that uh, or beef knuckles you can get more of these GAGs or glucosamine no glycans and these are basically um, these things that are most notable for helping with arthritis so one GAG for example is hyaluronic acid which has been used for years to help treat racehorses with osteoarthritis so really interesting right and another one of these GAGs can help to reduce arthritis pain um, glucosamine is a word that you're probably a little more familiar with which is a precursor to GAGs and this is notable to help with the growth and repair of cartilage so it's one of the best known joint health supplements glucosamine and you can get these GAGs that can do the same thing from bone broth and then you know healthy bodies they make enough GAGs but if your body has a higher demand again you might get some added support from using the broth to help meet that higher demand that like conditionally essential demand um, and then there are a couple other GAGs that can help with gut and soft tissue healing that can come from the bone broth but again it's that it's from the cartilage which is that like smooth plastic like white substance that wraps around the bones and the cartilage rich ones are like the chicken feed or the beef knuckles and then bone broth can also provide some minerals which you know might be better absorbed but it's not a significant amount compared to other foods what some might say is that somebody with a lot of inflammation in the gut might be able to better pull the minerals from the bone broth and use them better uh, because it is such a broken down form of food so that is one consideration but again you're it's not like a significant source of of minerals like some people think and then I wanted to add this slide about heavy metals because in 2013 there is a medical hypothesis from the UK that came out which is a small blinded study that showed that some broths have a very high amount of lead several times the recommended amount and so there is some huge red flags that went up from that and that's why in 2019 Dr. Carol Fitzgerald you know like much gratitude to her she did her own study you know funded her own study which is a pretty big deal for us and uh, found that there were no or low heavy metals in the thousands of bone broths she sampled and kind of came to the conclusion that it might differ based upon differences in the local environment so diet production practices ingredients cooking techniques and other factors could be playing into here so there's also they found that there's no significant difference in heavy metal content between organic and conventional bone broth which is really interesting right i wouldn't have expected that but that's what they found and they found slightly better with organic grass fed but probably not as much as i would have guessed so i wanted to make sure to share that with you and then I also wanted to share that as far as lead goes, uh, what they found was that the amount of lead in the bone broth compared to other foods, you know, in wine, there's 29 times the amount of lead than was in bone broth, 23 uh, times the amount in raisins, and then nine times the amount in shrimp. So compared to some of our other everyday foods, it was really a minimal amount that was found in the bone broth from her study, which is really good to hear. And, and I'm not saying that there's a uh, too much lead in wine to where it's concerning i actually don't know off the top of my head i have to look it up that's just kind of the comparison that was given in this in this study so not detected they didn't even detect any of some of these other heavy metals which include antimony beryllium bismuth cadmium gadolinium mercury palladium platinum tellurium thallium thorium tin tungsten <laughs> pardon my pronunciation of some of those haven't I don't think I've said some of those um, words in my whole life so anyway lots of those heavy metals were not detected so that's really promising and then stock versus broth 
I wanted to explain the difference here for you. Sock is basically broth that's cooked a long time. So sock is cooked two to three hours with bones and it yields, yields this like clear stock because obviously it's cooked for a shorter amount of time. And then broth is cooked for several days and usually with something acidic like apple cider vinegar which can help to pull out some minerals and amino acids from the bones and so it's typically richer in nutrients and that's why we were talking about the broth in this presentation today. You know, what you can do if you're making this at home is you can make a stock and then you can freeze those bones and make it into a broth later on with some vinegar and just to cook it much longer. So you can kind of repurpose the bones and get, you know, get the most out of them. And then if you react to broth, like again, if you're histamine sensitive reacting to broth, then you should consider just doing the stock and maybe still getting some of those benefits that we talked about today. Now these definitions, they come from wise traditions and I believe it's different in different parts of the world as far as what's considered broth, what's considered stock. So just kind of know that, but this is a common understanding. And then if you want to make your own at home, just some tips for you is to use clean filtered water because you might be getting some heavy metal contamination from water. Buy quality meat and then also you could consider using an Instapot to prevent it from smelling up the home. I have had clients who have mentioned that to me. They're very careful about when they make their broth just because it like makes the whole house smell like broth. And in this uh, in this module on the side, you'll see some downloads. You can download the slides like always. And I'm also gonna include some recipes there. So the recipes are from that restaurant I talked about in New York, the Brodo. So there are some vegetarian broth recipes in that as well, but just be aware that the benefits that we're talking about today are coming from the meat, stop, meat um, bone broth. So some takeaways, there is research supporting the healing and immune boosting properties of individual components of bone broth. So it's a good source of non-essential amino acids um, from the collagen and then some easily absorbable minerals. So I hope this was helpful and interesting to you. Uh, you can leave uh, any questions or comments below and I hope you'll have a great rest of your day and I'll see you in future presentations.